way race is going, racism is going to be um, mitigated, ameliorated, is not through people of color. <laughs> right? I just, I, historically, sociologically, that's, that's a fact. We can discuss afterwards if you'd like to, about why that is historically true, but it is true. So having a, an African-American person, Asian-American person, Latino person have to be the police of these things is not where it's at, right? That's not where it is. It is where it is white people having to take responsibility to how white people are dealing with people of color. So I will leave that there. In November, many of you know, Boston's Mayor Marty Walsh kicked off a year-long series of conversations and dialogues about race. We're delighted at Grub Street to be partnering with the Office of Resilience and Racial Equity tonight, as well as Boston's Literary Cultural District, District to host Who Are We When We're at Home? The Black Experience in Boston. The mission of the district, is this too loud? How's this, right? Uh, is to partner with organizations like Grub Street to, ra to raise awareness about Boston's incredible literary history and its vibrant present, and to encourage as much participation in the literary arts as possible. Adam Jones was jeered with racist, racist taunts and had peanuts thrown at him just this last Monday. Yes? You saw it on the news? It was not a good thing. Um, on Monday night at Fenway, the following day, Renee Graham wrote about the incident in the Boston Globe. Renee is our moderator tonight. She's an associate editor and op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe. Her work has also appeared in Essence, Out in America, A Portrait of Gay and Lesbian Life, The, My the Miami Herald, and elsewhere. In her editorial about this incident, on Monday, she wrote, I'm oh sorry, on Tuesday, she wrote, it speaks to the layers deep racism that has become as much a part of this city's national image as clam chowder and winning sports teams. What happened to Jones does not surprise people of color, but it breaks our hearts. This is our home, a place we have chosen to live, and even in an arena where there should be no greater concern. Okay. And even in an arena where there should be no greater concern than the game's score, a potentially racist act lurks out like a ghoul. Renee's op-ed is entitled, Stop Pretending Boston is Something That It's Not. Tonight, <laughs> tonight we're looking forward to exploring what Boston honestly is. With that, I give you Renee and this wonderful panel of guests that she is gonna introduce. Um, before I introduce this wonderful panel, I just want to say something really quickly. Um, to be clear, we aren't here tonight because a few months ago, Michael Che of Saturday Night Live called Boston the most racist city he'd ever visited. The issues Boston faces took stubborn root in the city long before Che and long before any of us were born. The sad and dangerous fact is, in Boston, racism, racism is so pervasive, it's been normalized. It's been rendered invisible, but not to those of us who must relentlessly endure it in some form or fashion. No, I don't think Boston is the most racist city in America. There are simply too many other serious contenders for that dubious title. <laughs> However, having lived here for most of my adult life, it is Boston's brand of racism and that I, and likely most of us here, know best. And with that, that's what we want to share tonight. And I'm now honored to introduce our distinguished panelists. Charles Coe is the author of two poetry books, All Sins Forgiven, Poems for My Parents, and Picnic on the Moon. He is also the author of the novella, Spin Cycles. He is currently serving as an artist in residence for the city, in Boston, city of Boston. Dr. Carrie Greenidge has taught at multiple universities, including Tufts University, where she currently teaches through the History Department and the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Her work includes historical research for the Wiley Blackwell Anthology of African American Literature, the Oxford African American Studies Center, and the Boston History for, uh, for I'm sorry, and the Boston History and Innovation Collaborative. <coughs> Dr. Tia Martin was appointed by Mayor Marty Walsh as the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Boston as part of the 100 Resilient Cities pioneered by the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation. Previously, Dr. Martin was the director of the Office of Public Health Preparedness at the Boston Public Health Commission. 
thanks to all of you for being here, and welcome. So let's get to it. I want to start with, what was your initial reaction when you heard about the Adam Jones incident at Fenway Park this week? And you're looking at me or all of us? All of us, Any, yeah. everybody, oh, all okay. of, yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, I would say I was not surprised. Um, I've grown up in the greater Boston area my entire life. I was born in Brooklyn, but was there for only two years before we came back. Uh, my family is has deep roots in New England. My grandmother was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and grew up there in the early 20th century and had some stories about New England racism. Um, <laughs> my uh, mother was born in the South End, my father was born here, but his family was from Barbados, so I had this whole history of, of knowing sort of Boston and greater New England's racial makeup. So I was not surprised. I was more, um, I think even though I am not that old, <laughs> um, hopefully, um, I, it seems as though about every five years this conversation seems to come up. Um, in my lifetime, it came up, let's see, when I was an adolescent with the uh, Charles Stewart case in the early 1990s. It came up again um, in the um, late 1980s when I was a little bit younger with the um, Willie Horton ad um, between uh, when Michael Dukakis was running for president. It came up again um, in the uh, mid-1990s when there was a whole debate over MECO and all these type of things. So to me, it's, it's not really a surprise. It seems as so these, these, these conversations tend to go in cycles, and about every five years, there appears to be a, a discussion. So I'll leave it at that. OK. So, um, so for me, I had similar sentiments. Uh, not surprised. Um, I grew up in Boston. I was born and raised here. Um, so this is my home. This is where my husband and I have. Uh, we have five children. Two of them are here tonight. Sonia, thank you for raising your hand earlier and contributing to the conversation. And my youngest son is in the back, who's 13, and we have three others who are older. Um, and so raising children in this city, we've kind of uh, experienced a whole range of things. And um, so number one, this doesn't surprise me. Number two, um, my immediate thoughts were every city, every place in this country is very deeply rooted in supporting the system of racism. Um, there's no place in this country where it does not exist, mainly because it exists in all of us, because <coughs> we all grew up here, we've been drinking the same Kool-Aid, we've been paying attention to all the same media, watching the same news, and it highly reinforces all of the stereotypes and thinking about who people are supposed to be, how they're supposed to be, and what we should expect of them or not expect of them. And so for me, um, it was not surprising, and, um, and for Boston to be labeled as the most racist city um, in this country, um, I think is an, uh, an overstatement. We do have our unique brand of racism, though. Um, the last thing I'll say is there's some interesting research that came out around um, implicit racial bias. And in really, it was about um, unconscious bias in general. Um, and what it said was, that the smarter we are, the more we think we have things handled, the more dangerous we are because we are not managing our unconscious brain and we are not uh, paying attention to our blind spots and therefore we're more likely to be doing things every single day to help support the system of racism, whether it's microaggressions, whether it's internalized oppression, the whole range of things. When we're not paying attention, we're more dangerous. And so when we think about um, kind of the uh, progressive um, nature of Boston and Massachusetts and we feel very confident because we've led the way of so many policy issues on so many things so we feel like we're we don't really have that much work to do here when all of us have work to do and in fact if we uh, reframe the way we talk about racism as not to just be about those extreme explicit scenarios where someone says the n-word or someone is throwing a banana or someone is throwing peanuts or whatever the case at people that there's on an everyday basis there are things that are happening every single day in this city and every city and town in this country where that perpetuates the system of racism we just don't pay attention to it and as you said um, it's become so baked into our culture as a country, not just as Boston, that we don't really see it anymore unless we're taught to pay attention to it and taught to use our consciousness 
um, to help manage ourselves, whether we're in our personal lives or in our professional roles in institutions. Well, when I, uh, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw the situation with Jones on the news, the first thing uh, that occurred to me was same bleep, different century. Um, <laughs> that's the <laughs> PG version. <laughs> out of Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're quite welcome. And the second thing I thought was, it's, it's a darn shame that there were 30 plus thousand people who were just there to watch a baseball game and a handful of knuckleheads wind up basically spoiling it for, for everyone else and getting us, um, getting us on the, uh, leading the evening news and not just that night. Um, and when people say that Boston is a racist city, I kind of have a problem with, with that too. There, there is obviously a lot of racism in the city and has been for a long time. But to say that there are a lot of racists in the city and to say that this is a racist city, those are, those are two different statements. And it's not a semantic difference mm -hmm. to me. It's a, it's a, it's a real difference. Um, I moved to Boston. Uh, I was in the New York metropolitan area. Um, I was doing music down there. And in 75, I moved to, to Boston to pursue some opportunities. And um, the next year, uh, Ted Landsmark was jabbed by an American flag on Government Center Plaza. And my mother called me from Indianapolis <laughs> saying, why in the world are you living? <laughs> I'm saying, well, Mom, it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's cool. I'm, I'm you know, flying under the radar here, and nobody's messing with me. <laughs> I was trying to keep her mollified, even though then um, there were lots of places um, most of Southie, uh, part, you know, around Bunker Hill, parts of Hyde Park, parts of Dorchester, parts of Somerville, where a guy like me walking around would wind up with a, a, a beer bottle or a brick bouncing off his head. That's not so much the case now, but the reasons it's not the case are sort of the subject of another panel, how a lot of what we're talking about really isn't just about race, it's about uh, money and class. And a lot of the working class people who used to live in these neighborhoods, well, they're not there anymore. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave my comments. Um, well, actually, there is one other thing um, that I'll say. Um, I have a friend who's, who was raised in the South who has lived up north for many years. And one time she told me that the difference between white people's attitudes towards blacks in the South and the North is down South, they don't care how close we get as long as we don't get too high. And up north, they don't care how high we get as long as we don't get too close. Hmm. Just a, a quick question. How many people here were surprised by the Adam Jones incident when they heard about it? <laughs> people are Interesting. <laughs> I heard about in 2017, I was surprised that, that was the only sort of thing that was surprising about it. Not that it could happen, but that, like, someone had to say it to say poppy or something, you know, like, that's, that's, I mean, what's, what's interesting is that it wasn't the only incident this week at, at Fenway Park. There was a second incident, um, and where there was a, a young father with his father-in-law and his young son. Um, who was sitting next to someone who made a racist taunt against the woman who was of African descent who sang the, the national anthem. And the father repeatedly asked the man what he said, and the man repeated the comment and, and made it clear he had no intention of backing down, uh, at which point the young father uh, called security, and, and the man was removed and, and banned for life from Fenway Park. And actually, that young father is here tonight. Oh. Oh, good for you. I mean, I, I think one thing that's interesting is, you know, you were just mentioning that you were surprised it took so long for it to happen. I think it happens quite often. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make the news. Because you had, you know, David Price, who pitches for the Red Sox, talking about he would hear it, you know, in Fenway Park. So I think the difference is, you know, what makes the news and what doesn't. And if Adam Jones hadn't said anything, we wouldn't know about it. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it happens with, you know, more, with more regularity than we, than we probably realize. 
Um, all of you kind of mentioned, sort of talking about, you know, Boston having its reputation, Boston's not the most racist place, but why does that cling to Boston more than any other city? When the Adam Jones incident happened, Twitter just sort of blew up with everybody's recollections of how Boston was so terrible, and I can believe that Boston's so racist. Carrie, as, as our resident historian, yes. <laughs> can, could you give us some idea of what that's about? Like why, I mean, we, have, we know about busing, but what came before busing? What, why is it that Boston can't seem to shake this image of being so racist? I think there's two reasons. I think uh, from a local historical perspective, I think that Boston as a city um, has functioned racially in a different way than we traditionally in the United States are used to looking at race. And that doesn't mean that Boston is less racist. It means that it has historically taken on a different form. So for instance, African American men, property only black men, have been able to vote in Massachusetts since 1783. There's no other state in the country that that could happen, right? Uh, Boston is the first city to legally desegregate its schools in 1855. Boston is the city that passes, or Massachusetts is the first state to pass a Civil Rights Act in 1865 before the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment is actually based on the one that was written in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is the first state um, to have an attor assistant attorney general of the United States who was African American, William H. Lewis, who was appointed in 1912. Um, so you have this long history where race in Massachusetts doesn't look like the rest of the country. So in 1783, people could say people of African American descent, African descent who are men who own property can vote. And so isn't Massachusetts different than Rhode Island? Isn't it different than Connecticut? Isn't it different than these horrible states that have uh, chattel slavery and chattel slavery spreads, right? In 1850, you can say, well, isn't Massachusetts progressive because we not only opposed the fugitive slave law, we got up in arms and we tried to rescue African-American people who were about to be shipped into the South. And so by that barometer, it is very easy to say Massachusetts generally and Boston specifically looks different. And in our country where we tend to think of racism as somebody in a hood or um, somebody who says racist things mm -hmm. or somebody who um, doesn't like, quote unquote, people of different races, we then can come to become very comfortable thinking that, well, then how could Massachusetts be racist? So that's the first thing, I think. I think the second thing is, is that because of that long history, Massachusetts has not had to reckon with its racial issues in the same way that other states have. So in the South, by 1964, you have the Civil Rights Act, for better or worse, right? And we know there's a lot of assaults that are going on against it, right? But that's passed. That fundamentally changes African-American life in the South. 1965, you have the Voting Rights Act that fundamentally changes the experience of African-descended people in this country and in the South. If you're in Massachusetts at the time, though, where African-American people had been able to vote, what does that mean for you, right? What does that not just mean for you, but what does it mean for white people who are responding to the way the country is responding to race? It becomes very easy for many white people in 1965 to say, in Boston, in Cambridge, in Wellesley, well, we're not the South, right? We are about to vote in Edward Brooke, who's going to become the first African-American man elected to the Senate um, at a time when Boston is in this racial maelstrom in Massachusetts. And he's elected. And where does he get elected from? The very districts that are out there about to throw rocks at African-American children attending public schools 10 years later. So it's, 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 part of it is that if we look at racism as something that is somebody in a hood or somebody who doesn't like somebody or somebody who says outrageous things, Right? It means that we tend to absolve ourselves, particularly people who would consider themselves progressive people, from that's not us. Right? But as you were saying, which is very true, it's all of us. Right? It's American history. And this whole conversation America is having right now is who is racist, is that person racist, is really irrelevant from a historical perspective. Because America has a racial, um, racially segregated, 
uh, system that exists, and that means it encompasses everything. It encompasses class, so you can't talk about class without talking about race. It encompasses gender. It encompasses sexuality. It's everything, right? And so um, part of it is that we shouldn't be asking which city is most racist. I, I had a friend of mine say, well, that's kind of like asking, well, which cancer is worse, the one in your lung or the one in your brain, right? And this is somebody who survived cancer, so. Don't, don't send me hate, hate you know, like, but this is, you know, somebody, this is somebody who would say, you know, which is, which is, it's like asking that question, right? And so you can split hairs and you can get a lot of doctors who would say, you know, well, actually, the rates for this kind of cancer are better for survival or this kind of cancer are better for this survival, but it doesn't get the fact that you still have the cancer, right? And so I think that's where we are as a country and as a city and as a state. And so the, the, the conversation needs to change. This reputation of Boston, the most racist city, I think, as you said very eloquently in your um, editorial, you know, there's a lot of other places that I think have that distinction, right? Um, but I do think that for a city that prides itself on being educated, on having high people who make a lot of money, on being at the forefront of so many things, socially, um, economically, policy-wise, that when you then encounter racism, blatant racism, it's like, well, that's not supposed to happen here. But it's because you don't, we don't see that racism actually, it doesn't matter if you have, if you make $70,000 a year and you voted for Obama, right? It's, it's, it's how race functions in American society, right? So. Can I add one thing to that? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Just in, so the, the question around, um, why does Boston have a, rep, a, a reputation for being racist or so racist? Um, so, I, so there's the historical context, right, and all of the images that came out of this city that showed us in the complete opposite light of all of the history before then. Mm -hmm. And it would, they were shocking images. I mean, when you have people attacking children and the cameras are there to see it, it, it paints a very ugly picture. So we were shown in our ugliest light all over the country, all over the world, and those pictures still endure today. That picture of Ken Landsmark mm -hmm. and that flag is won still a used. Prize. Yeah, yeah. won a Pulitzer Prize. Is everyone and familiar with that photo? Today. Those are the photos they're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's one piece of it. I think the other piece is when people then um, see movies about Boston, it's all about Southie. It's all about kind of terrible you know, accents. Terrible accents. <laughs> it's usually pretty much predominantly white characters, and so so even in the the psyche of what people are being fed about Boston, it's very white, and which is kind of ironic considering we're more than fifty percent people of color. I find that kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go around the country, people don't know that. Even people who've been here and visited, because we're so geographically segregated, people will come to Boston, they'll go to all the touristy places, and be like, where are all the people of color? Mm -hmm. So what, what, even sorry, in the on. experiences that people have when they come to this city, it doesn't help with the understanding of all that the city is. Um, and so we have, and, and then the last thing I'll say is we haven't necessarily, necessarily done a good job of advertising all of our diversity and all of the great history that there is here in Boston that goes beyond the revolution, mm -hmm. and kind of like all that stuff. It's like we haven't necessarily sold um, all of the wonderful things that we have to offer that so go when beyond When you say it. we, you mean? We as the city, as city government, we as folks who are trying to get tourists to come to Boston, what we advertise is very um, much about white history. Yes, and, and just as from a historical perspective, um, people of African descent have been in every single town in Massachusetts since 1638 or 1637. So to have this image that somehow this is recent or somehow people of African descent are like new or that somehow this history ends with abolition and then picks up again with busing, is completely that that just it, it, that's that, that's that's a historical lie, right? And you're very right that I don't think as a city um, we like to tell that 
aspect of our story and the fact that people of African descent have always been there, right? Um, which is something the city should be proud of, that you have that long of a history of people of African descent just there, right? Just here, right? And not just in Boston, you know, in Cambridge, in you know, what becomes Chelmsford and what becomes, you know, Worcester. I mean, that, that's, that's um, that, that we don't sell that. We don't tell, talk about that, right? Um, and it's part of what we, how we think of ourselves, right? And it's part of then how we sell ourselves to the, mm -hmm. to the world. I, I want to ask Charles, because you're both a poet and a jazz singer. Mm -hmm. um, okay. How has being a black man in Boston affected and influenced your work as an artist? <laughs> <laughs> Sardonic chuckle. <laughs> um, I, I, when I talk to my friends, my, uh, my artist friends who are black, one thing that we, we talk about that in Boston, as working uh, black artists, if it wasn't for white folks, we'd starve. It's the simple truth that uh, if you go to Symphony Hall, if you go to readings in, in Boston proper, if you go to um, the theater, if you go to see um, foreign films or independent films, uh, I wish I had a nickel for every time I looked around the audience and I was the only black person in the joint. Uh, and there's nobody standing at the door saying you can't come in. We are self-selecting out of a lot of what goes on in this city. But the other side of that and when I, I was at the Mass Cultural Council for many years, and we used to talk a lot about uh, diversity with cultural organizations. And I, I'd go to visit an organization, and they, I'd say, so what are you doing to address the issue of diversity? So, oh, we have a diversity committee. <laughs> oh, okay, that's nice. Who's on your diversity committee? Oh, you know, this, this white person and that white person and that white person and that white person and that white person. <laughs> and so there's a diversity committee that's clanking away in the corner and so it's, it's handled now but what look at your board look at your staff look at your uh, front of the house people look at your vendors you know d diversity isn't a question that can just live in a committee it's got to be part of the DNA of your organization and you have to talk to the people in your community and make the point to them that this is an issue, and not just because you're trying to be missionaries, but because there's so much that you are missing in your organization, in your enterprise, by not having our voices um, as part of the mix. And it's challenging because a lot of people who get involved with all kinds of organizations, cultural organizations, community organizations, there's a certain tendency to find a comfort level you know you're you're hanging out with the kinds of people you're comfortable hanging out with so a lot of times there it's not even a, um, a, an intention to to isolate or to exclude other people it's just it's, it's water to the fish people who are trying to hire uh, in a company who do they who do they pick up the phone and call they call somebody they know that's just the way the world works or it has been the way the world works. And our challenge is to, uh, to really challenge people on that mentality, to really challenge them to stretch out and for fairness and for reasons of self-interest, to start looking at the fact that within 20 years, uh, white people of European background are gonna be a statistical minority in this country. So how are y'all gonna deal with that, you know? How are you going to deal with it? How are you going to incorporate these? They're not even coming realities. They're, they're current realities in terms of what you see when, when you look around. If, if you get out of the, the cloistered little uh, environments that you're comfortable with, that you're used to dealing with, and you kind of look out around at the landscape, it don't look like it looked in 1958. But even 1958 doesn't look like we think 1958 looks. That's right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's that, right. That, anything else can get out get out of this. I mean, I, one of the one of the things that I, I try to stress, just as a historian, is that everybody's up in arms, like we're at some like pivotal moment, um, and I believe that we are. Um, just my, I know historians who are my mentors who would say we are, but I also think that this has been here before, right? 
um, and that we have we're, we're, we have seen this before, right? So Boston and um, Massachusetts have been in this place before. The country has been in this place before. The problem is, is that none of us have been in this place before, right? Or few of us have. But the country and as a whole and holistically has, right? So there's a whole backlash after slavery ended with Reconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. There was a whole backlash after World War I in the 1920s. There was a whole backlash during the 70s and 80s that we're living through, right? And so um, the, the idea is that how do we then create a system that is going to take those lessons from the past that worked, right, and implement them um, going forward, right? Mm -hmm. And so 1958 didn't look like we think 1958 looked, right? Um, yes, it might look more pronounced now, but you know, 1958, you, you had you know, African-American people who were moving into out of Boston and into the suburbs, and there were all these, uh, these controversies over that. You had Afri people who were migrating from the Caribbean who were coming to Boston and everyone was up in arms saying, oh my gosh, how is this gonna change black Boston as if Caribbean people hadn't been there before? You know, so so we're, we, we need to kind of take this historical perspective that we've been, that this has happened before, right? Even if we as an individual feel like we haven't experienced it before. Can okay, I just clarify, oh, sure. sorry. I just, that, thanks for pointing that out. I just wanna sort of hone in a little bit on what, what I meant by referencing 1958. Mm -hmm not the realities of 1958, but the perceptions of 1958. If you look at all the entertainment uh, and media of that time, um, we didn't exist. Uh, look, think of all the television shows. I mean, we had uh, Amos and Andy at one point, we had Rochester and a couple of other folks, but other than that, um, if, you were, if you were monitoring transmissions from your, your, your spaceship circling the Earth, uh, you wouldn't know there were any black people in this country uh, if you looked at television and movies in 1958. So it, the, the, the realities yeah. you're talking about, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the, the images, images that a lot of, um, the fantasy images mm -hmm. that a lot of white folks still have about that time. When uh, Mr. Tangerine Man talks about um, <laughs> making... <laughs> oh, delayed reaction. <laughs> making... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> when he talks about making America great again, that image is what he's talking about. Oh, yes. He's talking about taking, going in the Wayback Machine and taking America to some imaginary time, not so imaginary in one way, when, when people of color, when women were gay people, um, just kept their mouths shut and took what they were given and didn't cause trouble. Um, I have to say, you really sort of killed the song, Mr. Tambourine Man, for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for it that. Never, it never <laughs> happened. Yeah. It wow. never happened. <laughs> um, I want to bounce off something that, that, that Carrie mentioned. Um, whenever I write a column about race, I always get all of these emails from people saying, well, Boston is segregated, but it's not racist. <laughs> And to me, they kind of go hand in hand. I've never, I'm, I can't figure out how people can put these two things in separate rooms. Talk a little about this idea that people have that somehow segregation is different than racism and that they don't really feed off of each other. Well, it's interesting because I would expand it a little bit more because a lot of people today think that segregation today is somehow different from the segregation that we used to have mm -hmm. and that it's a unique brand of thing that um, somehow is not connected to any of the, the history that we have as a country or as a city. And so what I mean by that is we know that we have segregation not because people choose to live in different neighborhoods, <laughs> and particularly people of color, but because we have a long history of policies and practices that said people can't live in certain places. And not only could you not live in certain places, even if you had the economic wherewithal to, um, you, they wouldn't um, guarantee your loan, right? They wouldn't um, insure your loan, rather. And if you were a, a vet coming back, you couldn't get your loan, you couldn't get any benefits um, to, to purchase your home. So there's this long history of redlining and restrictive covenants and all these things that led to why we see the outlay of the city of Boston today. It looks the same in many ways, with some exceptions, if you mm -hmm. think back to Beacon Hill and 
in the way, way, way back machine when Beacon <laughs> Hill was predominantly an African American community. Um, but it looks pretty much similar to how it has for a long time. There's just more people of color now than there were before. Um, so for in this, this whole concept of um, can you have segregation and not be racist, um, I kind of want to reframe <coughs> it to, to, to say that segregation is a symptom of racism. And in, when we look at the policies, practices that led to the segregation we see in Boston and in every city across this country, um, when we look at um, the intersection of race and wealth um, and all of the policies that limited the ability of people of color in this community to get access to wealth, to be <laughs> able to do things like buy property in places they would want to buy property in. Um, and you fast forward to today, and then we ask ourselves, well, why, why do we see the segregation, and why, what, what is this about? It's, it's, there's a very clear answer. We just don't feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and so we, part of this is about us getting more comfortable with having these discussions so that we can really get to um, approaches that are going to help us move closer to racial equity, closer to social justice um, for lots of marginalized communities and groups within the city and other cities. Um, but really it comes with us just getting more comfortable with the fact that we oftentimes are chasing symptoms of racism and not dealing with racism. Not racism as the people who don't like other people as we were talking earlier, but racism as a system, a system that includes all of us as individuals. So it's not just that nebulous theoretical conceptual thing over here in a bunch of buildings. <laughs> there are people in those buildings, policies are created by people. All of that is created by people. And so we have to um, take this personal responsibility. And anyone who's heard me speak before has heard me say this a thousand times. I'm going to keep saying it a thousand more times, probably a million more times. But at the end of the day, this is a personal and individual responsibility for all of us because we are all splashed by this. It affects how we see the world, the lens through which we see the world. And we have to constantly be managing ourselves for our blind spots, blind spots that hurt other people and ourselves. And so this idea that segregation is somehow separate from racism is kind of laughable because it's just yet another symptom um, of the issue. Racism is also a process, right? And it's a market failure because if we really wanted to be successful as a society, we would not have so much human potential that is wasted, right? We would have more diversity in organizations because we know that organizations that have more diversity, but it's not just about having diversity. Um, there's a, a, a great um, a community activist who came to Boston and said, um, it's not enough to mix it up, you have to fix it up, right? So it's not enough to have diversity for the sake of diversity. We actually have to have environments and organizations that are prepared to take advantage of that diversity, to weave it into decision making, to really um, shift the culture of organizations to, um, to be able to actually impact better products and services on the other end. It's messier. Right, because when you have iron sharpening iron, right, that's that's what's happening when you have diversity. You have different minds coming together to come out with something different on the other end. And although homogenous groups usually feel more comfortable, and you feel like you got a lot done because you got it done so quickly, it's just because it's group think, not because you did any better, right? And when they have done studies over and over again on the other end of those studies, more um, diverse groups tend to perform better than the homogenous groups every time, right? So if we really wanted to be successful as organizations from an economic perspective, we would be really taking this on. If we really wanted to be successful in our personal lives and have and benefit from the great humanity and diversity that all cultures bring to the table, then we would be figuring this out and taking the, doing the extra work it takes to deal with the fact that we're geographically segregated so it makes it means that we have to work harder to develop those relationships but at the end of the day it's a market failure literally and figuratively in terms of organizations and our success economically but also in our ability to connect with each other on a human level I want to move it along because I want to make sure we have time for, for questions um, so I want to switch to policing in communities of color um, so far, Boston has avoided, you know, having anything to rival 
Eric Garner in, in Staten Island or Freddie Gray in Baltimore or more recently uh, Jordan Edwards who's a, a Texas teenager who was shot to death um, mm. in a car with his friends uh, by a police officer who claimed the car was coming towards him except the video showed the car was actually going away from him. Um, is it just luck or is it due to something that um, Commissioner Billy Evans is doing that so far Boston hasn't been touched on that level by these kinds of issues? Well, can I hop in for a second and say that um, uh, as far as I know, Boston doesn't have the same kind of problem that the FBI actually did a report on some years ago that was port reported by the major media that a number of police forces have been infiltrated by white supremacist organizations. And they, they see that they're very, they're very slick, they stay under the radar, they don't announce their politics publicly, but they see themselves as an army of occupation in, in the community of color. Uh, and as far as I know, that's a problem that we don't have in Boston. And, and I'd say part of it um, is the leadership, but part of it is just, I think we've been lucky so far. All it takes is just one wrong, per two wrong people uh, at, at, the, at the right time together for something to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I pray that it doesn't happen, but um, I, I think that there is, ironically, even though there's a lot more racism in Boston than there is in some other cities, the police force, uh, in, in my observation and experience, hasn't been doing some of the horrible and stupid things that have been happening in some other communities. Um, I, I think it also has to do with community policing. We know that statistically um, cities that have a concerted effort to create community policing, a partnership between the police department and the communities that they are policing, that statistically your rates of hostility and confrontation between the community and the police goes down. So I think that, that uh, Boston has a history of having that type of program. That does not mean that, that, that Boston somehow is, is, doesn't have um, issues between communities of color and the police. But it does mean that, you, that statistically when you have a program of a concerted, consciously created program of community policing, even if it doesn't do exactly what you think it will do, it tends to um, mitigate um, potentials for, for uh, violence. Again, that does not mean that somehow Boston is immune to, to, um, to these issues or that, you know, that can never happen in the city of Boston. But it does mean that, that we know that statistically that's something that can, can um, be the buffer. I guess the only thing I'll add is, um, so it's an and, right? So, mm -hmm. it's, so I agree with that, it's leadership and luck. Um, I think it's one of those things where um, the reality is, and I want to be really explicit about this, um, we all have implicit bias. No one is exempt from it. If you want to find something that connects all of us to each other, no matter who we are, it would be implicit bias, right? It is how our brain works. Not only is it how our brain works in terms of making the world an easier place for us to navigate, because it's doing its job. Our brain is doing its job. We get 11 million pieces of information in any given minute that our brain has to sort for us so that we don't get overwhelmed in our conscious brain, where we hear ourselves talking to ourselves, that voice that, that's not God, that's you talking to yourself. And so, um, but the reality is that it's a challenge for all of us. And so that's where the luck comes in. We're just lucky that, as you said, you know, we just didn't see some, the right mixture of people come together for an incident to happen. But all of us have it, and any time we let our guard down, and any time we're in complex situations where we have to do analysis, we actually have to think and perform complex tasks. We can't do it on autopilot. It always goes bad because our unconscious brain is filled with a lot of clutter a lot of stuff, Every, even stuff we don't believe in, in terms of who we are and who we truly wanna be, it's still back there and it comes out whenever we're not paying attention. And so that's the, that's the challenge that we face and the Boston Police Department has done work with implicit racial bias 
um, and unconscious bias as part of their um, trainings. Um, and so it's, this, it's um, a great starting place and it's a matter of connecting the dots and making sure that our community policing is also informed by that in that there's, there's, it's part of the culture and all those pieces and I think Commissioner Evans has done, has done a lot of work to try to shift in that direction. But it's like turning a giant line, you know, cruise liner or something. When there's another analogy that I'm forgetting right now. But you know what I mean. Oh, well, um, yeah, sure. And so, so there's a lot of work to be done there. But I, I see it both as luck and um, on leadership. I, I want to talk a little about these um, conversations on race that Mayor Walsh launched <laughs> last year. W what was the genesis for doing that now? And what's, what's the end game? What, how do you measure success mm -hmm. in, in that kind of thing? So it actually isn't a now thing. The mayor has made this a commitment um, from his campaign days. And really, it's a story that some of you have heard before because he loves telling the story. And there's a reason he loves telling the story. Um, and you'll know why when I finish. So when he was campaigning, he had a town hall meeting. We had a bunch of folks from the community. And a woman got up and asked him, so what do you think about race relations in Boston? <coughs> and he flubbed the answer. He admits that himself. He didn't do a good job of answering the question. He struggled with it, actually, and was so upset with the challenges he had with answering the question and his own discomfort with answering the question that he wanted to make it a priority as part of his campaign to dig a little bit deeper and to better understand racism, not just for him as a leader, but for us as a city. Um, and he actually <coughs> found the woman through her husband who came to a different town hall meeting that he hosted. Um, and when he saw, the, when the husband went up to him and told him, oh, I'm the wife of the woman that asked you that question, he actually invited both of them into the mayor's office, this was after he was elected, and thanked her for asking that question, apologized for messing it up, but thanked her for asking the question because it became part of his whole um, administration and so that's where the application for 100 resilient cities comes in funded uh, which was started by the Rockefeller Foundation which is what pays for me and uh, my my team um, and at the end of the day um, the application was actually written to be about racial equity and social justice and reference kind of our history and what was happening today um, so it's been part of the process from the beginning so November was kind of the okay like Here's the launch, but we've been working on this for uh, since before actually I came al on, along. Before there wasn't a TIA as the chief resilience officer, this was part of the, this was a priority. Why is it called resilience officer? Uh, because that is what 100 Resilient Cities calls us. That's the, that's the straightforward answer, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so they, <laughs> they basically, uh, there's 100 cities that are part of the network around the world. So Boston is one of 23 cities in the United States, and all of us are called chief resilience officers. Um, and really because the idea is that in order for a city to um, really build resilience in this way where it's about citywide resilience, um, you need someone to kind of have that mindset and then help build that culture in government. Um, so that's kind of the, the big picture thinking. We're, we're the only city, though, that has made racial equity and social justice as part of the, basically the foundation of our resilience strategy. Again, whenever I, I write about race, I get a lot of emails from people who identify as white who ask me what they should be doing oh, to make Boston question. a more racially just and hospitable place. Could each of you respond to that question? Even people who are are committed to being decent citizens can can fall into BS. Um, and I'll give you an example from my own experience. I was raised in a very uh, homophobic environment uh, in Indianapolis, and I was told and taught a lot of BS about gay people. And as an adult, I had to look at some of this wiring, some of this automatic, some of these tapes that were running in my head and notice the times when, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a tape playing in my head right now. And, and it's, it's never handled, it's never finished. I think for white people who were taught a lot of mess about blacks or uh, people of color growing up, that, that tape is never, uh, that tape is never going away. None of our tapes will ever go away. You were talking about how we all have um, ingrained programming mm -hmm. 
from earlier in our lives. And the, it doesn't make you an evil person to have that, that instant impression of someone. It makes you evil to not challenge it. It makes you evil to um, put that person in a box and nail it shut and there's no possibility for them ever getting out. Um, I, I, I agree with all that and I, I will also do an and. <laughs> um, I believe that there are a lot of people who abdicate their responsibility to vote responsibly. Um, and if you are somebody who truly believes or um, is, truly believes in social justice or racial justice of any kind, vote in the way that you profess that you believe. And that might mean you might vote for somebody who you might not necessarily like, right? <coughs> Emails. <coughs> <coughs> yes, exactly. <coughs> I've, but you, should, you need to, you need to, you need to, it sort of has to do with how it is that you, you vote. And I, when I talk about vote, I don't mean just for president. I mean for a school committee. I mean for when you, the, you're local. Everything is local. So do you vote in your local elections? Most people don't, right? Mm -hmm. Do you vote for in your local like town, or do you go to town meetings and actually see what goes on there and challenge people when they start to say mm -hmm. things about your city? Um, we don't want, for instance, the Metco program. I had a friend who, was, who lives in a, in a suburb outside of Boston, and she uh, is white, but she was saying she goes, see, she started to get really involved in her town, and she was like, people are having these really racially loaded conversations about schools. And nobody shows up to these meetings. And it's kind of like the old guard in the town having these conversations. Well, why do we have Metco? I don't want to have this. Blah blah blah. blah. And she she would she was I would say well, what do you do? She go well I just kind of like sat there. But that's a local thing, right? You show up at that meeting and you're the person who says you know the way we're having this conversation is wrong, right? And that's sort of the if you're really somebody who's concerned with that kind of justice, that's why I, that's why I don't mean president, right? I mean kind of like a local local level. Um, in a very, very powerful way and getting involved in a powerful way. And when you hear people having these discussions, right, um, that uh, you should be the one to, um, as the father did, right, say, well, what is it that you're, you're entailing, right? I have a, my brother-in-law happens to be white, um, <laughs> and he often says that when he's not with his family, the conversations he hears, and he has two children who are biracial, and sometimes he says, I want to just bring out my wallet and be like, this is my family. Um, and you know, the, the conversations he hears as a white man when he's completely by himself and having to be that person who says, you know what? You stop it at the, at the door right here, right? That, that even if that, you don't change that person's mind, you're saying you're not going to stand up for um, this camaraderie of being a white person and being able to, to say things that are derogatory about a group of people. Wow. So what, what should, what do we recommend for white people to do? <laughs> That's the question. They want to know. They, they want, want to know. know. Yes. Yeah. Inquiring so, whites want to know. So I'll make it quick. <laughs> not not can, everybody, but the people I, 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 I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just to kind of just to, before, I mean, what, one of the things people also need to know is that r racism is a, it, it, the way race is going, racism is going to be, um, mitigated, ameliorated, is not through people of color, right? I just, I, historically, sociologically, that's, that's a fact. We can discuss afterwards if you'd like to, <laughs> why that is historically true, but it is true. So having a, an African-American person, Asian-American person, Latino person have to be the police of these things is not where it's at, right? That's not where it is. It is where it is white people having to take responsibility to how white people are dealing with people of color. So I will leave that there. Okay. So I'll say the first thing is to take the time to learn about the lesser known history that has, uh, we've, we've ran away from. We don't teach it in school. Um, so if you don't know about the New Deal, and not just that it created the American middle class, but it, that it created the American white middle class and nothing else, um, then Go back and take a look at that stuff. Um, there's a great book. Let's see if I can remember what it's called. When Affirmative Action when was White. When Affirmative Action was White. Yep. Thank you. Um, it, was, it was extra slow in my brain coming <laughs> up about the cash. Um, 
the other thing, because um, history is important context. Like I just, I just need to underscore that because we think that we're all creative and coming up with a bunch of new stuff. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot that's new under the sun. I mean, we've seen it, it's happened, and everything that we see today is built on a foundation that is built on top of history and a lot of history and a lot of it that we don't know. Um, I'm still learning about history today <laughs> around s some of the um, institutional and policy and just attitudinal things in different industries going back to the beginning of those industries like the medical field mm -hmm. um, and how slaves were basically the testing ground for the American medical system in this country. So these are the types of things that we need to understand and learn and so that we can grow and, for, and, and we collectively, but also for white people. A lot of times when we don't have that historical context, we, it's easier for us to be like, this is an individual issue, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, that's because you are poor and they're, exactly. because you're poor, you're lazy, uh, excuse me, and you know, all these things, those, those boxes in our brains. But at the end of the day, um, that historical context helps to undo some of the things that we see all the time that are reinforced over and over again. Um, and it takes consistent, long game effort to, to stay um, woke, as they like to say. Um, as my, 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 uh, all my children run around saying stuff like that. So I, I get, you know, all that stuff in my brain. But, um, <laughs> if we really want to stay woke, it means you have to keep doing it. So it's like working out. So you can't just work out once and be like, I'm in shape, <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. You, you actually have to do it all the time. Um, the other thing I think is to learn about racial identity development and identity development. Um, there's a lot that researchers have learned around what are the types of phases people go through when they get exposed to what racism is. So before they get exposed to it and after. And there's a whole process that has been mapped out by researchers around for white people in racial identity development and what are some of the phases. And nothing's linear, but it helps to better understand like there, this is actually something that's pretty predictable in a lot of ways in terms of reactions people have. So when folks want to help deal with issues of racism, uh, a, a usual desire is to go into communities of color and save them, right? And that's actually not a good thing to do, especially if you haven't like dealt with your own racial yeah. identity stuff. And if you don't see racism as the problem that it impacts you. If you don't see it as your problem, as something that's impacting your world and your life, then it's, don't, don't, it's probably not wise to show up in a space to be the rescuer, right? Racism is impacting all of us and it hurts white people too. We don't talk about it, we don't contextualize it th that way, but it cert most certainly does. And we don't have time for me to get into the weeds. Maybe someone will ask me a question. We're gonna, I'm gonna throw the questions, but I just wanna read a few things from the list I keep from the people asking that question. Um, so I, what I have is, you know, stop tolerating racism. Stop acting like racism only exists when it hits the front page. Thinking a standing ovation achieves anything beyond self-congratulations. Start believing folks of color when they say they've been target of race, targets of <laughs> racism. Stop acting like segregation and racism are separate things. Understand that racism is more than, more than slurs and own your racism and how you benefit from it. Questions? Wow. <laughs> you got one, right? Shot right up. How's everyone doing? Uh, this is CJ Gunny from uh, Lesser and Leeward. And I just don't want anyone, because I've been living in Cambridge for six years, and I don't want anyone from out of town to get the wrong impression. Boston is not immune to deaths of unarmed black people. Usama Rahim is a black Muslim who was killed in Roslindale two years ago by the FBI and Boston Police Department. Burrell Ramsey White was a black man killed in the South End, originally from Dorchester. Uh, Mary Holmes is a black woman that was attacked at uh, Dudley Station by transit police. There's also been cases of deaths in Lynn and other cities around here. Um, so I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that Boston hasn't had these issues, uh, just that they have not been reported. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking because this is not really a panel for where I need to speak. But um, if you follow Mass Action Against Police Brutality uh, on Facebook and Twitter, they will tell you a lot more about um, the current movement and the very wonderful black and non-black activists coming out of Roxbury, Dorchester to do this work. Thank you. Mm 
Hello. Oh. Hello. Um, I wanted to. Um, I was there was something I took a note on as far as um looking at the policing and I feel weird. I should just like rotate. Just um, <laughs> the uh, police. Woo! Wow. Mm, the. <clears throat> The policing in Boston, because uh, the Boston Police Department is actually the first police department in the nation. Um, uh, I think they're also the first police department to, uh, for the commissioner to get on TV and apologize to the black community. It's in Mayor Menino's book, May You Rest in Peace, look it up. So in that way, they're a descendant, uh, direct descendant of fugitive slave patrols. And so with Boston's like you know his deep history of being the first, um, I, I think of an example, uh, Boston Latin School, uh, my alma mater, um, first public school in the United States, only in 2017 appointed Rachel Skerritt, she's wonderful, as uh, the first headmaster of color, the first, uh, the third female headmaster, and the, uh, the first female headmaster <coughs> of color. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, uh, or sort of throw out there was a, how to sort of mitigate or uh, hold a complex understanding of the dichotomous history. I mean, I went to a fantastic poetry reading the other day at City Hall. Poet Laureate hosted it. Danielle, she's really cool. She's from Dorchester. She's a woman of color. She's very talented. And it was in the, uh, the Albert L. Dapper O'Neill Committee Room. Um, I think you can go on YouTube and hear uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill. Um, I call him Crapper. Um, on he's lit, he literally calls black people the N word and and likens them to monkeys on TV, and he has a whole room at, at City Hall. I, I don't. I, um, uh, but um, someday, um, Melissa Saunders Hall. Uh, so what I was wanted to ask was how, as a you know, um, as a just a person to mitigate this dichotomy. I mean, you can't really go back and make uh, slave owners who attended Boston Latin School unattended. But we can, you know, things can move forward in the sense of appointing uh, Mrs. Skerritt as, um, as headmaster. And, and likewise, you know, I don't think, I think, you know, the O'Neill Committee Room will still be there on Monday uh, and probably there for a long time next to the Tip O'Neill Building. So what I'm asking is how to manage, uh, like, you know, this sort of dichotomous history where, you know, we, we do have, um, I'm not going to say a great police department, but you know, a, a, it's like you said, a dubious title, but uh, how, how do you manage something like that when it's so deeply embedded into the history of the institution itself? I'm sorry I took the scenic route with that question. I mean, I mean just from a, from a historical perspective, I think that uh, if I could leave anybody with anything from a historical perspective is that American history, all of those things have always existed at the same time. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what city you're in, America, how could you have Thomas Jefferson um, eloquently um, create the Declaration of Independence at the same time that he sells his own children, right? We, we, that's, who, that's what America is. It's the two things have always been connected to each other. So what I would say is that, that that's who America is. That's what Boston is, right? And it's not to be fatalist and say we can never eradicate racism, because I don't believe that that's true. But it is to say, once we start to recognize that those two things exist at the same time, you can't have somebody have a Boston Latin school and not have slavery, right? Want to read a good book? Um, Ebony and Ivy, excellent book. Mm -hmm. Craig Stephen Wilder. That's what, how colleges and schools were created, was off of slavery, right? There's no getting away from it. Can't, Harvard's now doing all this research on it. That's just the way it is, right? You can't possibly have a police department in the United States that isn't built on racial oppression. That's, that's, just, that's just the way, that's how it happens, right? right? So once we start, part of the history is saying, once we start to really recognize that, and not in superlatives, not in having like a, a somebody say, <laughs> have this be rhetorical, but actually saying that, that that is what it is, right? Once we start to do that, then you can start to try to have some type of um, way to deal with it. I'm, I'm not pretending to be like a policymaker who knows how to, how to snap my fingers and knows how to do that, but I, I don't believe this country, like this city, has ever come and said, you know, they aren't opposite. They've never been opposite. Freedom couldn't exist without slavery. Slavery couldn't exist without freedom, right? James Baldwin, James Baldwin famously said, why do white people need the end? 
That, that says more about white people than it does about black people. But you can't have those two things together with, by each other. They have to exist, coexist. And so once we start to realize that historically that's the way that that's what, the, that's what America is, right? That's what Boston is. That's what all of our institutions are, even if we don't know it, right? Then that's when you can start to say, start to get, try to get into a solution of how to, how to deal with it. Can, can I ask you a question? Should then Boston be doing what people have been doing down south with Confederate statues in terms of having a room at City Hall named for Dapper O'Neill? I mean, what, like, I, I mean, should there be, should, there, should people agitate? Change the Dapper, sorry, just, right. I, change the Dapper O'Neill uh, room to the Shaquille O'Neill room. Because when the Shaquille played for the Celtics, he did more for Boston than Dapper. Change it to the Melissa Saunders room. I'm not, I'm not even trying to toot my own horn, horn, mm -hmm. horny brat. I was born and raised in Dorchester. Okay, I was born in South Bend, but I was raised in Dorchester. I've done more from the city than Dapper O'Neill. And like when I go to like get my birth certificate or go to harass Tom in his office or what have you, I see a, a, a reminder that this guy has a whole, he's a whole room named after him. And he's like, but see, but here's the smugness of Boston in a funny kind of way. You know, we're sitting here and we're saying, you know, oh yes, Yale needs to change the name of that dorm from that segregationist. And they should be cutting down those Confederate statues in Alabama. But here they have a Dapper O'Neill room at City Hall. Now, if anyone who doesn't know who Dapper O'Neill was, he was this virulently racist city councilor in Boston. Uh -huh. His name was Albert O'Neill, and he was known as Dapper O'Neill, because he always wore nice suits, but he was a racist. And there's a room named for him at City Hall, which I think probably most people don't know. <laughs> so this is what I mean, this is, the, this is the Boston thing. There is this kind of high and mighty quality about Boston, you know, that we know better. But then you get to something like the, the, the Dapper O'Neill room, and you go, oh, then you're really no different than having a Jefferson Davis statue, are you? Well, we could have a conversation about taking the name of every slave owner and, um, and Robert Barron um, off every building um, that those names are on. And I, I don't argue against doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I sure would like to see uh, the FBI building name something else, uh, and a and hundred other buildings I could name. But my, my hope would be that the first thing that happens is that people start talking about that, that they start looking at those buildings, at those, uh, those schools. You know, if you look at uh, Duke University, uh, if you look at the Yaki Foundation, yes. you know, and on and on and on. So there's no short of, of examples of city resources or um, regional or, or, or federal resources that are named after what we consider horrible people. Uh, we're not going to get all those names off those things, but we, we can and we must start talking about who that person was. In the real history of the person, I think one of the powerful things, I have a, a friend of mine who runs the Robbins House out in Concord, Massachusetts, which is a house of an African-American man who lived in Concord and interprets his life and the life of people in Concord. Didn't just start moving there now, right? 1833 is when they lived there. Um, and she says, well, you can still have the sign, but why not tell the whole story of that person? Mm -hmm. Why not say Dapper O'Neill said these things and did these things? and supported these policies. And so this is what this room is, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that, that is, that's a historical record. That's what you're, that's what you're recording. Yaki's were this. This is, this is the historical record of what we're doing. We're not making it up, right? This is, this is what it actually is. Mm -hmm. that, that, to me, is, is very powerful. This is Jefferson Davis, <laughs> right? This is what Jefferson Davis said about African American people and Native American people and how they should be exterminated, right? And if you put it on, on the plaque, I mean, that, it takes on a different, a different mode yeah. than, yeah. you know, if you're actually saying what the history is. But that's, that's, that's what I mean by people not recognizing the history and not wanting to see things in the same, it, that they, it, they coexist. It's like, we'll give you the room, but we're going to tell people everything. everything. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and one other thing about that, it's just like the, the Baseball Hall of Fame. All those sluggers who were hitting 10 million home runs a year when they were juiced up on steroids, put them in the hall but have that plaque yeah. under their statue and say, this dude was juice and roids. So draw, draw your own conclusions. Yes. Except Roger Clemens, don't ever put him in. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for that. I, well, I'll be brief in, in just, I think, adding to kind of this, this idea of what, how do you live with the two dichotomies of what Boston is, what the police department, the history is, and police departments in general. Um, so the only thing I'll add is we, we own it. 
Like you don't manage it, you own it. Like we, we, people are complex, life is complex. And even people who have done amazing things have also done horrible things, right? And so we have to um, just be honest about the complexity of people and situations and life and the police department and Dapper O'Neill and all these other people and institutions in this city and in this country have a complex history, a complex reality. Um, and so we oftentimes look for people um, to be messiahs, perfect, this image of perfection. And then we paint them with this image of perfection and then we celebrate them and you better not say anything horrible about fill in the blank. And when, when the reality is we're all human, none of us are infallible. We all have flaws. And so this idea of being clear about that and when we're talking about history, when we're talking about these types of situations, I think is really important and powerful and just moving against the current culture we have of deifying um, certain people to the point where they can do no wrong. It's dangerous. All right. Can I, can I say one quick thing about, um, you know, stepping back and looking at, at racism as a sort of a two-part system. One, they're the plutocrats. Because racism at the root is about money. You know, it's always follow the money. But then you, you look at the working class people who voted for Mr. Tangerine Man and are, are voting against their own interest. And you, you have to think of something that LBJ said, that you, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the highest black man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. So if that doesn't describe what's going on with the Koch brothers and their ilk at this point, I don't know what does. Can I just have one, just one more piece? This is really quick, I promise. So just the last piece is also the, this, this on the theme of high and mighty. Um, we look at Trump supporters and the people who voted for Trump like they are the most vile people, like they're those racists over there. And for some of us, those are our loved ones, those are our relatives, those are people we know and care about. But for some reason, in the same way we deify people, we demonize people. And if you just think about um, the fact that all of us started somewhere, we, so if we, take, if, if we accept the fact that we all grew up in the same school systems and learned the same stuff, and at some point we were not woke, right? We started somewhere, we learned, and we came to a place where we understand these things now. There are folks who don't have the privilege of being around diversity. What they know about people who don't look like them is what's on TV. And if you thought that the world looked like what was on TV, you'd, be, you'd have a skewed perception of a lot of things, relationships, a whole mess of stuff you'd be wrong about, right? And so as we think about um, kind of the high and mightiness of pointing fingers at other people, also having some empathy for the fact that there's a reason why people believe certain things. That's the world that they live in. And until they get exposed to other things, that will continue to be the world that they live in. And so understanding where people are coming from and that people are feeling left out, that this issue of wealth inequality disproportionately affects people of color, African Americans, Latinos, the whole range of folks, immigrants. But on the other side, it's also affecting poor white people. Right? So we have to be thinking holistically um, as well about the fact that although issues disproportionately impact communities of color because of racism, there's also other systems of oppression happening that are connecting folks. And that quote that you just said was really powerful in that vein because we have these shared struggles that we are not addressing or focusing on because we're distracted by the squirrel or the shiny object over here. Um, so. Thank you for letting me just get that out. We have time for maybe two more questions. That's what I'm yeah, we certainly seem to be um, as segregated as any major city around. Um, how do, and it, it's hard to see how this gets better if we don't address that because people, mm -hmm. aren't, people aren't living around each other and they're, they're just not interacting, getting to know each other as people. Um, what should we do about the segregation? Is there anything we can do directly to uh, address that? 
I mean, I, I think if I think gentrification is making it worse. Yes. In a lot of cases, the city's becoming less and less diverse as more and more people get pushed out. Um, you know, and some people say that's capitalism and that's progress and that's good for the city, but is it? You know, overall, you know, I mean, it's nice to see areas that are being developed that were abandoned for a long time, but who's moving in? And is it? And is it? And is it? It's literally changing the complexion of the city. So I think that's actually making it worse. So I'm, I mean, I'm not sure um, how we change that. You know, you, people can't live in neighborhoods they can't afford. You know, you go where you can afford to buy a house, or you can, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't, I'm not sure how we get around that, especially now. It's not just in Boston. That's pretty much every big city right now is going through that. Yeah, I don't know if there's a systematic answer to that question. It, it, like you were saying, it gets down to the individuals taking responsibility for figuring out a way to spend some time with people who don't live on the block. You, you know, you have, I'm tired of seeing the words luxury condos <laughs> in Boston. Yeah. Uh, um, mine, mine is a little bit a, a commentary on that, actually, um, that exact thing. I, I grew up in Philadelphia in East Germantown. My parents, for whatever reason, they never did go out to the suburbs like every other white family in that part of Germantown. And so I grew up in an unusual circumstance and went to high school uh, in that same neighborhood, which was predominantly black. And I end up in Boston, and I end up in Needham, Massachusetts, and I certainly look like I belong, but I was an incredible culture shock. <laughs> and ever since being in Boston, I, I have felt whiter and whiter to the point where I woke up one morning realizing that I'd become a rich white lady and I had no idea how that happened. And I struggled. I, I hate when that happens. <laughs> 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 well, you know what, me too. Sorry, I, I couldn't resist, please go on. It was a setup. But, so I, I so I, you know, and so I struggled, my God, oh, how'd this happen? And then I realized, ultimately, I was a rich white lady because I was allowing myself to live in a rich white lady's world only. And, I mean, this is, it was Needham, and then it was Newton, but even Newton. And, you know, and it's, it's, it, it is an individual decision that you don't want to surround yourself all the time with people who look like you. And there's no question that here in Boston, you know, Philadelphia is no, you know, mecca of solidarity but nonetheless there's all these opportunities you know you can grow up in neighborhoods where you are go to school and there's just more people of different races in neighborhoods together there here it becomes a very it does become a deliberate act it becomes a deliberate act not just to sort of spend your whole weekend and your evening doing all the things that keep you outside of a city and an urban center and a neighborhood, whatever that is. And when you look at the events on the Boston.com calendar of things to do, and you know, it, it feels some way contrived at first. I mean, and it is because you're 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 in search of relationship. But the but at the same time, as you do that, you start to see people again, and then you start to realize, hey, you know, you have conversation, and. In the in absence of being able to do something systematic to change the geographical segregation of this city, you know, when people white people ask, you know, what can I do? I mean, that that's sort of one of those. You can you can leave your white. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but but at least you're getting the people who are asking, mm -hmm. who 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 really in their heart want to know what to do. And part of that is, you know, it, it it's almost too obvious, and which is just move in just just like get yourself out of your cloister and your universe and and you know it, it's not gonna it's not gonna lead it, it's a first step it's something that you can take action to do um and there's no question you know the standing up against whatever the comments are that that's and not always easy for people but yes absolutely but it's also putting yourself in a place where a person of color or someone who's not like you all of a sudden they, the distance you, you have conversations about things that you would be having with other people they don't people don't seem as different as they did when you're only spending all your time in this fishbowl that everyone looks like you can i say just one quick thing yeah. that folks like you who are asking this question are so much not the problem it's not funny yeah this is a writing conference and i'll address this to you charles mm -hmm. 
Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Can we talk a little bit as a final note about narrative and the, the, the power of the stories we mm -hmm. tell ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about this country, um, the way we learn, I'm sort of riffing on what Dr. Martin was saying earlier, the way we, you know, when you think about what people know about people of color who don't know any people of color because they're taking in the evening news, right? Or even the way, you know, and I, I think it's changed a little bit, the Boston Globe in the last five years, but before then, I think all I ever read about Roxbury was about crime. I never saw a church social. I didn't see a 5K. I didn't see any normal life, even though I know that was going on, right? I, the, the only story that made the paper was viol a violent one. So that is the narrative that gets into people's skulls and is really, you know, so I don't know, the, the promise of Moonlight winning the Oscar, um, Jordan Peele's movie Get Out. I mean, these things seem very hopeful to me that there's a, there's a more complicated, interesting, individualized narrative that we're starting to see in mainstream places. And Charles, maybe you could just speak a little bit I'll, about flipping that narrative. For, for it, this won't take me long at all. <laughs> <laughs> we have to tell our own stories. We have to own our stories. And all of the stories. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and a well-meaning person who's not part of my life or part of my culture, I'm not saying that person can't write compelling fiction or nonfiction about our lives, but the, all those wonderful pieces of writing are hollow if we're not also telling our stories. History is written by the winners, you know, the history that we grew up with in, in, in school. So, I mean, when you saw a movie like Hidden Figures, I left with a lot of different emotions. I was thrilled um, by this movie, and I was outraged that I could be a 65-year-old, pretty well-read, pretty well-educated black man, and I had never heard this story before. How could that be? So, we gotta be telling our own stories. Yeah. Read the book, too, the book's amazing. And and just another thing, the, the way those stories get told, let's be honest, is money. So one of the things I always do, I have two sisters who are in creative arts, <laughs> um, is even if I do not like the person who's producing something or it's not my taste, if it's produced by a person of color, I turn it on. Because that's a way that it's being recorded in some way, netherworld that I don't quite understand, right? Uh, you know, I turn it on because that's showing the people who make the decisions that people watch it. Mm -hmm. So do I particularly like to watch, um, do I particularly like sitcoms? That's not my taste. But I always turn on Blackish and get off the boat. <laughs> because those are two shows that are showing people of color. And if nobody's watching them, then we complain because there's no people of color on TV. So I can't complain if I don't turn it on, even if I don't watch it, because so I don't like Do I have to watch? Exactly. Does that, mean, does that mean I have to watch Tyler Perry movies now? No. No, that, that I draw the line attention. there. That gets a lot enough attention. I'm yeah. more of a taken one for the team, but you yeah, know. No. Yeah. Okay. No. Got <laughs> but no. I mean, still, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, you tur turn it on. Mm -hmm. Just have it there so that it's being played so nobody can say, oh, nobody's watching a show with an all Asian American cast. Yeah. Or Rock. Yeah. You yeah. remember Rock? Rock. Rock. With, yeah, yes. That was an amazing yeah. show, mm -hmm. and nobody watched no. it <laughs> all right well not enough people to keep it on television uh -huh. and we weren't writing letters to the networks uh -huh. saying keeping this show on right. you know so frank's place frank's yeah, place frank's place <laughs> yep <sighs> fantastic Th thank you all so much oh, I, for I, being I here tonight it was a fabulous thank conversation you <laughs> Did I cut you off? Do we have a hand for Renee especially? Woo! Renee! Can I, can I add something about narrative? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I, I'll add is that when we think about the stories of who we are um, and, and who gets to tell those stories, um, Part of the challenge that I see is that we oftentimes see them in the boxes. We see them as a black show. We see it as an Asian American show, but no one says that's a white show, right? So the stories that we tell 
connect with lots of different people if we open ourselves up to the actual story. That's why Moonlight was so powerful because if you've just paid attention to the story, it resonated with lots of us because a lot of the experiences we have as human beings are relative, right? We can connect with those things. So when we talk about Blackish or these other shows, Blackish is doing really well because <coughs> it resonates with a lot of different people. The struggle of going from working poor to middle class and what does that mean and, and all the well struggles written. and it's well written mm -hmm. and it has awesome mm -hmm. cast but anyways um but just that we see stories not in the racial categories so that we can actually understand and enjoy the story that is being presented to us and be able to connect with it on a human level so i'll just leave it at that uh, well said, Thank you. Well said.